Welcome. Welcome to another of our Wednesday Yachting Luncheons. It's beautiful out these windows, and we're all happy to be here, for goodness sakes. Let's see a little bit about our future speakers. Uh, at the end of the year, we'll have the traditional father-son Christmas luncheon with shanty singers, the Sots, the San Francisco Boys Chorus, um, uh, characters of you and your kids, uh, and the knot tying contest. So that's always a fun, great event. Uh, Gary Jobson will be coming in December, December 12th, to talk all about what's happening in the world of sailing. Uh, he's written 19 books, and he'll be talking to us all about his um, most recent book and what's happening in match racing, in the America's Cup, etc. Uh, in November, the end of November, Mikhail Vinikoff will be here to talk all about um, Ranger Road, a program that he created, a 501c3, which is a, a mechanism for active duty sailors who are wounded and disabled in action to transition to the private sector. And it's quite an adventurous um, path that he puts them on where they jump out of planes, they surf, they do all kinds of things that uh, bring back that feeling of camaraderie that they felt when they were uh, at war. Um, November 21st, Lee Bruno will be here to talk all about Misfits, Merchants, and Mayhem Tales from the San Francisco Waterfront. Waterfront, it's a great history of San Francisco Waterfront told by a great storyteller. And next week, here, Bob Heller, former governor of the Federal Reserve Board, will be here to talk all about tariff, trades, and Trump. We'll get to hear what uh, we have to be concerned about or happy about with regard to our current trade policy internationally. No one I could find knows more on this subject than Bob Heller. He's made an incredibly informative presentation, which I've been looking at for a couple of weeks, and you're going to enjoy it quite a bit a little bit about our speakers today. We'll have two speakers today, uh, Gina and John. Gina Bardi um, really doesn't come from the world of sailing. She comes from the world of library sciences. She got her master's in library sciences at San Jose State, and we're graced to have um, her paying attention to the stacks on uh, our behalf. It's great that sailors know somebody is paying attention to the archival uh, material that has been gathered in San Francisco about the great history of sailing on San Francisco Bay. Her really first time when you asked, did she get on a sailboat, was eight years ago on the Alma. Those of who sailed on the Alma. The Alma is a great historic scow. There is actually a great tradition of scow sailing back and forth all over San Francisco area, especially because of the shallowness of San Francisco's little inlets, Sausalito and so on. Um, and then she got her greatest thrill in sailing was racing in the Master Mariner beginning in 2010. That's an exciting thing for her. Since then, she's gotten kind of into it, so she's sailed 10 or 20 times on the Alma, and, and that's a wonderful thing. And what she likes about it the most, what some of us call the zen of sailing, is that feeling of isolation when you're out on the water and you like listen for a second to just how you're getting through, how the boat's being moved, not by the engine, but by the sails. So uh, I think she's hooked. What do you think? I think she's hooked. Um, her co-speaker, has an incredible name, John Muir. Just that alone would get him an opportunity to speak at the Yacht Club. John actually actually has a sailing pedigree. Uh, sailed around Mount Desert Island loads and loads of times. If you've been to Maine, you know about Northeast Haba. It's not Harbor, it's Haba. Northeast Haba, Southwest Haba. I've sailed there a lot, and it's a beautiful place to sail. And he sailed on the most credentialed of small boats, A, Hershoff, 12 and a half. Holy cow. Nathaniel Hershoff to yacht design is, you know, like a little bit like Thomas Jefferson or something like that. He's incredibly fa famous, famous name. Well, to sail on a Hershoff 12 and a half is to sail on a legitimate, genuine, cool little dinghy. He sailed all around there, then got his master's in cultural resource management at Sonoma State. And that's an appropriate degree to be paying attention to the yachting activities and stacks and libraries in San Francisco Bay. And we have one other guest here who's in a related part of the world. Our own Charlie Hart is the CEO of the San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park Association. They're related. They're in the same building down there in Fort Mason. We want all of those of you who love the Bay to sort of applaud for both Charlie and these speakers. Thank you. 
for helping make thank thank you for helping make our our uh, Bay Heritage pre preserving our Bay Heritage. And so with that, uh, Jean Barda, Jean Barty, and she'll speak first, and then John Muir will speak. So thank you, Gina. Good, it's all set up for me here. Hi, hi everybody, welcome. My name is Gina Barty. I'm the reference librarian at San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park. Uh, can I get a show of hands of how many people have been to our park before? Oh, good. oh my gosh, that's the most I've ever seen raise their hands. How about the Research Center? How many people? Yeah, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Well, I don't even need to give this talk then. You know all about us, so. Um, uh, that's great. Uh, I like to say our park is kind of spread out. and We have the ships down at Hyde Street Pier. I like to say that's the, the heart of the park, but where I work in the research center, that's the brains of the park. So, um, uh, And uh, I'm here to tell you about some of the collections that we have, our archival library collections. Um, just to give you an idea, some of you, even if you've been to the research center, you might not know the depth of collections that we have there that are available for you guys to come in and research anytime. So that's kind of my job here today. I also want to give a special thanks to Charlie and Robin with the association over there. Their work, um, they work to support us both in funding and in just general support. So if you like what you see here today, go over and have a talk with them afterwards. I'm sure Robin can uh, find some projects that you might be interested in helping out with. So um, I want to talk about my, I always say my collections, but they're actually our collections, and, and in effect, they're your collections. It's a national park, so everything that we have belongs to you. So I encourage you to come in and, and see what you own. You don't even maybe have an idea of the amazing things that you actually own. So uh, let's get started. Oops. My slide's not. Oops. Technical. Isn't this always the case? All you need to do, hold on. Yeah, just touch that. Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> I had that. I knew to touch a button. Yeah, there you go. Oh, okay, great. Thanks. There we go, great. So this is our reading room here um, uh, where you could come in while you'd be looking at the collections. Uh, it's kind of a beautiful, nice little room with some artifacts in it. Our library collection has over 70,000 volumes um, and we have collection strengths are in uh, yachting and boat building, voyage accounts and magazines. So um, I didn't bring anything about boat building and the voyage accounts because I figured you guys might know what that is, but I wanted to point out, highlight some of the magazines that we have. We have over 50 yachting magazines, titles, 50 titles of magazines, some of them dating back to the turn of the century. I love this Yachtsman One boat show. That's from the 30s. If you notice the center one, that's actually the Zapata Two of a St. Francis series. Uh, so I thought you guys might get a kick out of that. So if you own a boat, this is a great way to do research on the boats that you own because there's always stories and... Um, uh, Oh, this is a great one. I just came across this today and I had to end it, uh, add it in here. This is Tom Crawley. I'm sure some of you have heard that name before. Shows the value of his sailor training when he modernizes his sister's high neck bathing suit with his sheath knife and lashing. So uh, I just sent that to Tom Escher, if any of you know him. Um, this is another picture from the Yachtsman magazine, which I love. If you see here, this is uh, two men and, and a woman here. And I don't know if you notice here, but we can look and see her shoes that she's wearing. And I, what's, what's the old quote? Uh, Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did backwards and in heels. So uh, let's not forget our yachts women who are out there in their heels uh, working on these collections. <laughs> Um, another thing we have in the library collection are yearbooks and race results. So again, if you have a historic vessel on the bay, if you're doing any research, this is a great place to come and look and find out about uh, previous owners of your vessels and the life of your vessel. Uh, also little things like this is the first time the bird class has been introduced in this uh, Pacific um, 
Inter Yacht Club Association yearbook from 1926. So there's some, I know we have some bird boat interest in there. Uh, we also have an archival collection. So our archival collection is huge. We have over 1,700 archival uh, collections. And the difference between a library collection and an archival, library is usually material that's published, mass produced. Uh, archival collections are unique and one of a kind. So in regards to yachting, what we have, uh, I think our strengths are log books, so log books of famous yachts that are on the bay and maybe not so famous yachts. Uh, we also have lots of yacht club ephemera. So uh, definitely if you're looking to um, do serious research or maybe just get a new Christmas card or decorate your house a little bit. Uh, we have things like, uh, this is the collection from the San Francisco Yacht Club records, date range 1880 to 1958. So we have yearbooks, scrapbooks, race charts, specifications for vessels, membership rosters, so um, all kinds of stuff. And I just threw a couple pictures up there so you could see. Um, here's some stuff we have on St. Francis Club. This is actually in the Yacht Racing Association records. And I just had to, I don't know if, I saw on your board out there, you still go to Tinsley Island. Um, still. I don't know if you know, uh, do you still have the stag cruise to Tinsley Island? The stag cruise? So this was... Uh, so I have here a little memorandum about the, uh, the stag cruise that's coming up. And uh, one of the things I like about it is, uh, oh, it's actually on, on this one to the bottom, the purpose over there. It's, it's everybody's welcome except feminine and junior members. So, uh, and then also the other thing I love is here in the liquor and bar service, it says one bottle of liquor per person will be, will be handed out. So you have to come early to get your one bottle of liquor yeah, <laughs> per person. Uh, and then a bunch of your old main sheets from the 40s where you can see what they had for dinner on Thanksgiving and all different sorts of fun news events that are coming up. So I know you guys have an archives here, but um, we also collect some of your history too. And it's really important to us because you guys are a huge member of our community. Uh, talking about logbooks, uh, we have logbooks from the CHISPA. I pulled three of my favorite logbooks to talk about here. I don't know if you guys know the CHISPA, but here's a picture of her sailing. She's a beautiful, beautiful boat, uh, and they like to have a good time on that. So there are Commander Gut uh, and his crew enjoying a glass. I don't think that's coffee. I'm not sure what it is, but I doubt that's coffee there with their cannon to start the race. Just because I'm such a big dog fan, I had to include this picture because I just think that's darling. That's their, their, he has his little dog house there. I could actually come back and do a whole presentation on dogs on, on boats, and it'd be so much fun. Uh, next year, and when I first saw this, I actually thought that cannon was made for the dog, but it's, it's not. That's the, the race cannon. Um, here's some of the uh, entries from the logbook of the CHISPA. You can see they'd always uh, talk about the parties they were having. They'd always have people sign in so you could kind of look and see who were the guests. They filled it with little pictures of what they were doing. Uh, met a lot of characters. There's a lot of funny stories in here when you go through, uh, through here. Um, uh, Ron mentioned that I'm hooked on sailing, and I certainly am, and I'm certainly hooked on yachting parties. So I'm available for any yachting party. <laughs> Uh, that you might have. Uh, this is the Idler yog logbook. The Idler was another famous vessel here on San Francisco Bay. Uh, I just chose one page from this because I couldn't resist that Shaw killed an old lady goose. Um, this is uh, on one of their uh, Shaw killed a honker. I feel like they were probably hunting and drinking, which I don't think is the best combination of things. I do not, I do not advocate that, but it sounds like perhaps they were on this. Uh, this is the Jester logbook. Uh, the Jester, again, is another um, famous vessel on the bay, and they went all over. And I love this one because um, they, the man who kept this wrote so beautifully about his experiences, and he was so uh, swept up with the characters that he met. And he has a beautiful passage in here about being on the river and how time kind of stands still, and you get swept up in this vague mystery. And it just kind of reminds me of the messing about in boats segment of The Wind in the Willows. And if you see right here this man uh, with, the, with the interesting hat, um, if I can read it, it's, I think, Frank... 
can't read his last name from this, but um, he's a clam man in Monterey, and he ended up watching their boat for him one day, and he was actually good friends with um, Robert Louis Stevenson and sailed on the Casco with him. So here's a picture of Robert Louis Stevenson and his party aboard the Casco. Um, I didn't see that man in that picture, but uh, let's not forget San Francisco, San Francisco has some great yachtsmen and women, uh, including um, Robert Louis Stevenson and Jack London, who I'll talk about just in a little bit too. Uh, so this is the Idler logbook. So besides his beautiful stories that he told, he also took lots of samples of wildflowers along the way. So it's a, a pressed logbook. So um, I don't know if any of you, I know you probably keep logbooks of your journey, but if you uh, do narrative logs, uh, it's such a wonderful gift to have, to, to leave to other generations so they can share those journeys with you. I would really, really highly recommend doing something like this. We also have uh, logbooks from the Wanderbird. I was here uh, a year or two ago when uh, you were war honoring Warwick. Um, uh, and so this is the, the logbook from that voyage. And what I love about this is he has such a relationship with the weather. So you go through this log book and, and he'll say things like, hail, sleet, hell. Or uh, I'm looking dirty at the present squalls. Or finally, nice wind uh, f favoring us for once. And then he has this beautiful one up here. Boy, what a wonderful day to be out uh, thrilling. What a wonderful day and a thrill to be sailing. You know, so just these nice little moments that he captures within his log books. My probably favorite part of the collection though is our photograph collection. We actually have about 500,000 photographs or more. So uh, we have got you covered if you are looking for a picture of a ship. I only ask one thing, if you call me, please don't say, do you have a picture of a boat? Because as I said, we have about 500,000 pictures. So <laughs> gotta narrow it down a little bit. Three of our largest yachting, uh, yachting collection photograph collections are the Walter A. Scott photograph collection, which is about 2,500 unique photographs of yachting on San Francisco Bay from the 1870s to 1939. The Jack Airhorn collection of Stone Boat Yard, that's about 900 photographs of yachts under construction and underway in the Bay Area around the 20s and 70s. And the Myron, Small, uh, Myron Spalding and Spalding Boat Works Yachting in San Francisco Bay, 1860 to 2010, more or less, over 2,000 photographs uh, either taken by Myron or um, collected by him. So again, if you have a boat that's on the bay that's historic, um, you really need to come see me because we might have pictures of it you've never seen before. Uh, and if you have pictures of it, we would love to see them. That's how we grow our collections. That's how we build this community, is, is realizing that we're all connected here together. Um, this is a great uh, picture. We also have some smaller collections. We have a lot of scrapbooks, which are a lot of fun. Again, a lot of yachting parties. And I love this one too, because you know how it is when you go on your yachting party and you put your hat on and your bustle and your corset and your 12 layers of clothes. I don't understand how these people are sailing with all of those hats on. It just doesn't make sense to me how they're, how they're doing that. And I also don't know how they use the head. So that's a whole other question. Uh, the Walter Scott photograph, so it's not just sailing, we also have some beautiful steam-powered vessels. Uh, this is the Mogul, which I just think is beautiful lines on this, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous little boat. Uh, this is the My Girl, uh, which is a yacht that I think Paul Reck is actually working on a model of this soon, I'm not sure. Perhaps, yeah, he's gonna be working. This is uh, in the Walter Scott collection. The Walter Scott collection is beautiful because you could feel that wind, like you could feel the, the, that sail coming up. Here's another one of the Hummingbird 22. I love this one. This is yacht racing off of Mission Rock in 1876. So you see all the, the yachts that are there, but also look how many square riggers uh, and uh, different vessels are in the background. So if you think it's crowded out there now, think if you're dealing with these giant square riggers coming in from around the horn and uh, dealing, negotiating around them. Uh, this is just a nice little mood shot of with the fog there and everything. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Isn't that gorgeous? I, our photograph collection is unparalleled. I could really just talk, I could do a whole talk on, on that. Uh, I threw in a couple St. Francis photos for you. I don't know if you've seen these. These are building the seawall here. This is from about 1933. Here's a, another one, clubhouse uh, under construction. This is uh, the Marina Seawall here. This is dated 1933. Yeah. 
This is the Altair, which is a, a San Francisco Yacht Club yacht over here. I believe this one's in the 30s, too. The uh, bay still looks the same. This one is the Scaramouche with uh, Tompkins was your Commodore at this time, uh, 1934. And I just want to point out there's two women on the crew there in the, in the back there. I always like to point that out. Uh, and this is Myron Spaulding. I talked about him earlier. This is uh, the Suomi. Was that how you'd say that? Suomi? Uh, docked at San Francisco, uh, St. Francis Yacht Club after their return from the 1947 Trans-Pacific Race, where they finished first in her class. So, uh, yeah, Myron Spaulding is the one in the middle there. And this is the Suomi on launching day. And I just love this photograph because you just see the lines of her so beautifully that, that keel is mm, to die for. Um, I talk a little bit. I could also come back and do a whole talk on yachting fashions. Uh, I just, again, love the idea of like going to take your, your boat out and you put on your high starch collar and your tie and your bowler because you wouldn't be caught dead without a tie, a tie on. Or perhaps you're a little more flashy and you, you go with something like this with the, the polka dot. Or if you're a woman, you put on your tam o' shanter and your big skirt. This is a nice one. This is the magic carpet, a two-masted schooner. Just the, I just love this because everybody looks like they're having so much fun on this. I mean, this is the epitome of, of a good time had by all. And I love this because uh, I just love these sweaters with the contenders. I, I really think we should bring back a yachting uniform when you guys race and sail. And this kind of like Batman villain style sweatshirt there. Batman villain. <laughs> uh, this is the invader. Uh, again, notice the woman. This is a crew portrait. There's a woman on the crew in her skirt and heels again. So... Now, this isn't you guys. This is the Corinthian Yacht Club, but I one of my favorite pictures in the collection here. This is their end-of-season run, and every face in this picture could tell a million stories. It uh, uh, looks like they've been celebrating a little bit here, and it uh, looks like loads of pancakes, perhaps, that they're eating. Um, Another large part of our collection are plans collections. Uh, our plans collections are huge, and our plans ac um, archivist, Sarah Diamond, is actually uh, here with us right now. So uh, if you have any questions afterwards about plans, please talk to her. We probably have over... Right there. Probably have... Yay, Sarah! Uh, we have probably close to, what did you say, 100, more than 100,000. 150,000 plans. So if you have a, a vessel that was built here or modified at any time, we might possibly have a plan of it. Uh, we have the Jack Airhorn collection of Stone Boatyard Naval drawings from 1912 to 1975. The George Whalen Naval Architecture drawings from 1921 to 1947, about 700 plans. Uh, and the Myron Spaulding and Spaulding Boatwork records. So not only do we have about over 2,000 drawings, we also have all their business records and project files. So again, if any modifications were done, we probably have the work documenting that. That could be really helpful for you. Uh, this is a Spaulding plan showing modifications to a Sparkman design. And some of these plans to me are just works of art. They just stand on their own as something beautiful to have. Um, I try not to be crass and talk about commerce at all, but uh, Christmas is coming, holiday season, and plans and photographs make lovely gifts for people. This is uh, uh, the Miyake, I believe, which was a, a steamer from uh, Stone Boatyard as well. Uh, this is uh, drawings of the My Girl, which is built as the Water Witch, witch by George Whalen. So you see the, in the corner up here, um, we get plans in all kinds of conditions. Some of them are really falling apart, need a lot of conservation work. Sarah does all that con conservation work. We try to do everything in-house. Um, everything that comes into our collection, when we accept it, it's in our collection for all time, for good. Uh, so we're very selective about what we take in, and when we take something in, we care for it, and we care for it greatly because it's yours. We're taking care of it for you. Sarah does a great job on plans conservation. Again, that's something the association helps us out with, funding, um, funding 
activities like that, keeping these plans so that they'll be around for a really long time. This is a beautiful one of the Mary Beth, another Whalen drawing. Uh, Wayland drawings there, some lines, just, just gorgeous. Again, like you could just put this on your wall as, this one's beautiful, the Volante. The Volante is a, a beautiful uh, sloop that he designed, 40 foot, 41 feet. And just these two. This, the one in the upper corner, for some reason, reminds me of like the Da Vinci picture. There's just something about it that's, and again, all these plans are hand-drawn, no, not computer-generated. Uh, a lot of them are ink on linen, yeah, and some hot tissue paper. Uh, here's a bird boat framing in the bottom by uh, George Whalen, and then some offsets at the top there. So, um, so not just plans of your own vessel, but if we have any model builders in the house, do I have any model builders in the house? No. Okay, we'll tell your friends. Models uh, are great, and we have a lot of great plans for model building there. Well, I think my time is just about up, and I'm going to turn this over to John. But what I wanted to do, just leave you, this is a beautiful picture of Jack London and his wife, Charmaine. And uh, it's the Londons aboard the Snark, and they're trying to ascertain um, their vessel's position here. And so um, I just love this photograph. Uh, I think it captures a lot about the the voyaging and the, the excitement of voyaging together and, and what that means. Um, and I just wanted to remind you that uh, when you set out here to go on whatever voyage you go on, don't forget that we're right over there at Building E, and we have a lot of stuff that could help you on your voyage of life. So, <laughs> John. Oh, I'm sorry. I also have um, uh, flyers about the research center and my card on this table over here, so I'll be available for questions and everything afterwards. Thank you. I'm at the museum at Hyde Street, though. There we go. Uh, thank you. Yeah, there you go. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, such a pleasure to be here. I'll put the microphone up a little bit. Uh, John Muir is the name. I'm the curator of Small Craft at uh, San Francisco Maritime. And uh, tough act to follow, Gina, and particularly the historic photographs and the beautiful plans. Um, I can't emphasize enough the world-class caliber of that archives and the, and the people that are working there. I'm always out talking to people that have old photographs and old plans and encouraging them to, to donate for their protection. And I can do that with full confidence with the staff that we have, um, just an incredible staff. But in addition to, as many of you in this room know, in addition to the plans and photographs and the history and the, and the various ephemera, um, there are also the boats uh, that are vastly or are fast disappearing from the world. And a lot of you here in this room are stewards of some wonderful classics. Uh, and um, very in, have done very inspiring works in your lives to, to keep those boats alive. And that's, that's a large part of my job at the park. Um, we have actually a, a shop in which we restore and maintain uh, vessels as well as some storage. And now I'm just going to try to figure out the buttons here. Uh, which one am I pressing? Because I don't want to... Space bar. Works. Space bar. There we go. Space bar. <laughs> Got it. This one. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, we have a, a collection of over... Over a hundred boats uh, in the park, and many of them are actually stored in our state-of-the-art exhibit storage space in San Leandro. It's actually fairly new, um, with uh, ed environmental controls, and we are starting a series of tours over there. So many of these boats that I mentioned today, you will you'll be able to come over and look at, and sort of we'll uncover, and it's a, it's very much an experience like the Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, kind of opening the doors to the government crypt, and uh, there there is the, um, the 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 Ark of the Covenant in there, and for some of you, I'm sure, in the form of some of these boats. Uh, the other place we exhibit our boats and our collection is at Hyde Street Pier, in the water for many of them. Uh, we have eight or nine historic boats in the water. And sort of a, a central part of it and ever-growing are the yachts in our collection. Um, here is our, uh, an image from this morning, in fact, of the Hyde Street Pier. And in the foreground there, you'll see um, one of the earliest yachts I was involved with at the park, Mary Bear, Bear Boat Number 1, 
which we, uh, when I came on, was in a warehouse all dusty, and we, we actually went and restored it, uh, both the hull. We replaced the transom uh, with uh, accurate oak transom, and uh, it's an amazing curved curved piece of work, and uh, that was in our shop for a couple of years. And we went on to uh, order some period sails and do actually period rigging with some eye splices. Um, so we have quite a collection and growing, and I'm very proud of it, of the one designs of San Francisco Bay, which I know you're all familiar with the lore. Uh, this is bear boat number one, uh, built in 1932. And recently we sort of had the, the crowning achievement or the crowning donation of our collection uh, by a gentleman in this room has donated uh, the oldest bird, which is in fact the oldest one design on the West Coast, um, and that's the curlew. Uh, bird boat number two was donated very generously by Mr. Bill Clausen. Bill, would you raise your hand and let's all give him a hand. Uh, not only is it a beautiful boat, but as we all know, nothing sails like a bird. And I did have the pleasure of sailing on it uh, with uh, some of Bill's ringers against Bill. Uh, and we came in second. He beat us. I don't know how he did it. He caught some amazing puff of wind. But that's her on the Master Mariners this year. Um, donated to us, fully restored, uh, which to me is a real honor uh, to have the trust of the community. Um, I think the, the, our restoration of the bear and our participation in Master Mariners with the bear uh, might have made Bill feel better about uh, letting it go to us. But to me, this is something we dreamed about. I've been at the park for 28 years, and to have a, uh, the oldest bird out and racing um, is a real dream come true. And uh, we hope to keep it out and racing. We, Like I say, we did put in Master Mariners this year. We're hoping to partner more with our association, Charlie at the association, to continue to, um, they've been great in sponsoring us and our participation in Master Mariners. We're hoping to do Master Mariners, Jessica Cup, maybe a couple other races, and eventually uh, snatch that perpetual trophy away from Bill <laughs> with a little luck. Um, so we've, we've that, that, like I say, was a crowning achievement, and it's largely a crowning achievement because it was a real big piece, a glaring hole in our collection of one designs from the bay. We have also Golden Gate number eight, which is also Baby Bird number eight in the old days, the Coipo, which right now is actually in our shop on Hyde Street Pier, and I'd really encourage you all to come down. We put a few images up and told some of the history of the uh, birds and Golden Gates and Baby Birds. Uh, they are in the shop, so you can both see the chips flying. Uh, we restore everything if we can in kind, so we've replaced the teak with teak and the cedar with cedar and the galvy screws with galvy screws, unfortunately. Um, um, but then, and then they'll either go on display in the water or and participate in our waterborne programs and cultural events and with the yachts, hopefully racing, because that's really where they belong. Uh, the Golden Gate also will go likely in some of our exhibits on, on land. Uh, the other ones in the one designs that we have are the Teak Lady number five, the Do Sim, uh, which is now in storage but uh, beautifully restored by the donor as well. Uh, we raised her in Master Mariners some time ago. She was uh, built in the 30s. It was one of those unique stories where they were, it was designed by a San Francisco area designer, Mr. Kilkenny, um, but he had been overseas a bit and uh, teamed up with um, Ah King, the boat builder in Hong Kong, and had a bunch built. And they're entirely built of teak, and I think that was part of his strategy. He could get cheap teak and fairly cheap labor to build the yachts. And this is one of the beautiful things about being the shepherd of the yachts and the, and the culture resources is when you start down the road, you ha get a yacht into your collection, often people come, then come out of the woodwork and say, hey, I've got photographs, or I've got the plans, or my father was Mr. Kilkenny, which is exact, ex exactly what happened with the Teak Lady. We actually had the daughter of Thomas Kilkenny come in with a photo book of the Teak Ladies being built in Hong Kong. And... Uh, just stunning because you can see here, this is just one sample and this, this, these photos are in our collection of a traditional Chinese craftsman with an ads hand hewing the keel and the stem and the stern. And we have a lot of images like that, just Chinese tools, Chinese craftsmen in a very rough um, uh, boatyard being sort of watched over by Mr. Kilkenny as they 
as he sort of teaches them and, and keeps an eye out for San Francisco Bay standard yachts. And uh, so all these were shipped over and ex displayed at the Golden Gate Exposition in 39. And the, the, the class took off such as it is. It never became a big class, but there are still a couple out there. And the Teak Lady, of course, will be the one that lives forever in our collection. Um, we have some other ones. This is the Golden Gate Exposition, in fact, right here. We have uh, the MAB, which is the um, International One Design, which was largely promoted through the country. I know there's a couple of uh, National One Designs. Not the International. This is the National One Design. I'm sorry. Um, and this was also exhibited in the 39 Golden Gate Exposition. Uh, we actually have a, quite a few boats that were that that happened at and that was largely because that was the birth of the one designs here on the bay it was really the explosion it's such an exciting time and our collection now pretty much captures almost all the one designs this is the um, in fact the mercury's speaking of great san francisco bay one designs designed by the nunes brothers uh, went on to become a national racing class an olympic racing class as many of you know um, we are actually being offered, uh, we're, we haven't taken it yet. I'm on my way down to Monterey next week to take a look at it. We're being offered Mercury number one. So that will be a, that's another glaring hole. It's one of the first plywood one designs. Uh, so that will be in our collection. Not sure it'll stay in the water, Is that but. Is um, <laughs> 580, a little bit later. <laughs> I'm sure uh, twice as fast, though. Oh, great. Well, thank you. And he was, he got, uh, we'll put him in touch with number one, number two. Yes. Uh, 12, 22. Yeah, that, th that was you. Though, thank you because, Can you that yeah, we, we were just saying we're on the verge of accepting into our collection Mercury number one. And that actually came up over a, uh, a coffee discussion with Hal Oyen, one of our uh, ace volunteers. And we do take volunteers who, if you all haven't had enough varnish work on your own boats and want to come down and also leave whenever you want, uh, uh, come on down to our shop. But uh, we talked about it, and he said, well, let me make a few calls. And I guess he must have talked to you. So uh, we got offered number one, number two, number 22. We had quite a few. It's quite a response, which, again, is just very exciting for us. So... Uh, uh, almost to the point where we are, oops, that, that jumped ahead a little bit, but where we uh, have a, quite a representation of our one designs. If I want to go back a second, do I just press uh, return? Back arrow. back arrow, there we go. Um, there are, of course, a few minor holes. Uh, we also, I wanted to mention, on the lesser extent, uh, you know, smaller extent, we have El Toro number five, and we have uh, Pelican number one, uh, Chloe Maru. So, um, feeling great about preserving the history, and um, there are a few other ones, a little, particularly little ones. Uh, we ha are limited as to how many big ones we can take in space-wise, but uh, Shamrock, the Moon class, it's sort of the more obscure, obscure small classes of the 30s and 40s we're still looking out for, uh, but thanks to Mr. Clausen and the potential of uh, acquisition of the Mercury, we may have the one designs pretty well taken care of soon, and a lot of it will be either on display in our our exhibit storage in San Leandro for tours or in the water. Um, we also have focused on some of the other uh, vessels from pre-One Design era, pre-Birds. Uh, we were donated this one, which is um, a little less known than the, the wonderful Yankee or um, some of those, the Chispa. This is the Kathleen, which did come close to winning a race in 1915. It was sort of a contemporary, built in 1904. It's a centerboard gaff rig sloop. And it had sort of changed shape over the years in order to keep it alive. The owners had uh, sheathed it in fiberglass, um, added on a mizzen, chopped down the main boom, uh, sheathed the decks in canvas. It was really kind of encased like a mummy in a, in a whole extra skin. Uh, but we recognized the credible beam, and uh, it also had a keel put on it, ginormous keel, so centerboard's gone. But we knew from, from oral history, and we could tell from the shape, that we had a real gem, a special piece of San Francisco history here. Um, I'm not sure she ever went up against the Yankee, but uh, I, I, and I'm sure she didn't win. Uh, but she was just one of that breed from the 19th century, and we thought, we, here's one in the flesh that we can really go after. So we, we brought in a, a, a scanner, a 3D scanner, and some experts. We got a big point cloud. This is actually a bunch of points. And from that point cloud, modeled it in 3D. 
So we've documented, because it's very fragile. It's been encased in fiberglass, so we actually opened up a few holes in the fiberglass, and the boat sort of started pouring out of it. Um, so we thought, we better document it before it disappears. So we documented it all the way down to the special, uh, the windlasses and the anchor, anchor winch. And um, from that 3D model, we were able to produce all sorts of special plans, axonomic plans, axonometric plans, the lines plans, very accurately. But what we really wanted, you can see here the, the big keel and the lines. What we really wanted to do was to get back to what she looked like in the old days. So we superimposed that 3D model over a variety of historic photographs, some in the Scott collection uh, that Gina mentioned. And from that, we're able to tweak the 3D model, the existing 3D model, to a, a closer 3D model of what she looked like when she was built. Uh, of course, it was a much longer process than that, but we did get down to having uh, recreated, using historic photographs as well for interior details, sort of her construction plan. And it's our hope now, this, this, this is like a standard sloop. You look at a lot of the old photographs and um, a lot of that standard sloops uh, from the 1890s, big centerboards, gigantic booms overhanging, just treacherous uh, gaff rigs. Uh, would love to sail one someday with this. Just a skimming dish going over there. And our hope is that now we've recreated, we've taken the artifact of one of these vessels and really done our science work to recreate the plans accurately, save a piece of that history, and now there's a blueprint for somebody to build a replica. And we may not have the funds, but um, we're hoping somebody shares that passion and uh, perhaps it's a project we can get Charlie and the association behind, but we'd love to see one of these gaff rig centerboards out there. Um, so any takers, come, come by and talk to me afterwards. Uh, I'll get you a few drinks. Um, <laughs> the other thing we've done in all of our documentation, so we have these boats, some in the water, some in storage. Uh, we've gone through and we've drawn plans of a lot of them, and not always the big yachts, but sometimes yacht tenders. We actually have an incredible collection of tenders to yachts. In fact, the Kathleen's tender has come into our collection, and we've, we've drawn that. I couldn't find the drawing to, to show today, but we do here. You'll see the drawing from the, the tender to the yacht Baruna, which was obviously well-known here in the bay, and I think there's a model just outside, but we have, there's a little dinghy. And um, included with that dinghy, we, we, we documented all the details. So we have the, the stands that the dinghy would stay in on the deck. And you can see it's sort of asymmetrical uh, down in the lower corner there. And apparently that, that's the way she fit just right on the Baruna's deck. So there's clues to the history in the, in the three-dimensional objects. And some of our plans and drawings have captured that both for model makers, or if any of you would like to sort of upgrade your dinghy for your yacht, you can um, be the first one to have a replica Baruna tender on your, on your yacht or towed behind. Uh, we've also gone through, we have uh, a tender that was sort of produced normally by the stone boatyard. We have a beautiful stone boatyard tender. We also have some yachts or sailing boats that were not so much in the racing scene, but were part of the real history of the bay. Um, most notably right now, we have uh, the Mermaid, which we've gone through and produced a full set of drawings. So uh, we've had quite a few requests for that. She's become a real, um, a real cult, uh, cult figure in the Japanese. We have a lot of Japanese tourists coming through. And in fact, we've put her, uh, you might have remembered her up on the veranda of the museum building for many, many years, but we've moved her into a kind of front and center in the museum lobby. And she's on exhibit now, and we're actually recreating her rig. We're gonna have on exhibit her sail with the mermaid figure on it. Um, right there in the museum, it's free. Come on in and take a look at it. And as well as an exhibit, sort of a picturing a lot of his artifacts from the voyage and talking about his voyage. So uh, sailboats are, are, are very much either exhibited on, on the water or in the museum building. And um, I think you find a lot to enjoy there and, and know that uh, we'd, we'd always open uh, to more insight from, from this part of the community uh, for, for yacht history and not history details or uh, helping us find um, some rare and old yachts that we still could get into our collection. So uh, just a real pleasure to be here, and we look forward to seeing you down at the pier or at the Research Center. Uh, thank you very much.
Thank you. Welcome again to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. We have as our guests today, Gina Barty and John Muir, um, yachting historians and um, the keepers of yachting history in San Francisco Bay at the um, Maritime Association Public Library. I probably <laughs> butchered the name. Fix that name. San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park, and it is a national park. Wonderful. So um, how do you guys get funding, and how much? what's the annual funding for your, for your program? <laughs> First well, off, thanks a lot. It's great <laughs> to have you here, and it's great to know that um, you know, the yachts of San Francisco Bay and the yachting history of San Francisco Bay is in such uh, thoughtful, caring hands. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so to answer your question, we are a national park, so we do get uh, cyclic government funding, uh, ever diminishing right now, it seems. But uh, there is some st very stable funding, which is, is a great comfort uh, when you have such precious resources. You don't want them to have to be sold, uh, as many private museums might do. These are very much in the public trust. Um, we also get a lot of funding through our association uh, with Charlie and the San Francisco Maritime National Park Association. And in fact, uh, they've done a lot of very creative fundraising, and they allow us to kind of go outside the box, particularly with boats in the water or special preservation projects. They, they, they provide an opportunity for the community to, to jump in and support, and they've been really key to a lot of our more fun projects. Did I hear how much annual budget is? Ah, uh, the in fact we just had a budget lecture. Uh, I believe the I was the, paying attention the whole time, but uh, the base funding I think for the park is about six million a year. That covers salaries. There's about seventy employees. So uh, that also helps to cover some of our we get some extra project funding which changes year to year, which allows us to do the you know the small projects like hauling out the Balclutha. And uh, and or the Thayer or the Eureka. So um, we have a we have a we're a very oddball organization for the national parks. We have incredibly uh, rich cultural resources, uh, very expensive cultural resources in the water, or and also uh, just a lot of artifacts and archives. So a very sensitive cultural park. Give us a sense of the size. What's the square footage uh, footprint? of uh, the library and spaces on Fort Mason and then separately over in your storage facility in San Leandro. Yeah. Well, the park is really spread out. So we have uh, Hyde Street Pier with our historic vessels. And um, uh, quick update, the Balclutha, I think, is coming back in December, right? I think that we're here, so the Balclutha should be back then. Uh, then we have our visitor center, which is across the street, uh, which is about 5,000 square feet. Uh, and that's free. And if you haven't been there, there's a great exhibit on San Francisco waterfront history that's just gorgeous. Uh, then we have our museum building, which is that beautiful building at Aquatic Park. The Art Deco building. Yes, the Art Deco building. Uh, and then we have the Research Center, which is over at Fort Mason Center. So the park is really kind of spread out along the way. I don't know if that, I don't know the exact square footage, but we are the largest collection in the National Park Service, which means we're the largest collection um, in the Department of Interior. So um, Yosemite has more trees, but we have more things made from those trees, so. <laughs> so we get the benefit by looking at the cool pieces you've got assembled, but give us a day in the life of, of a librarian or an archivist. What, what, do you find items? What Give us... Yeah, every... What I love about my job is every single day is different. And my job really depends on the questions that I'm asked by people. So... Um, uh, you know, it, 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 every day differs. It could be somebody who's a genealogist who wants a picture of a vessel, or it could be somebody um, doing academic research on, uh, you know, the history of San Francisco. We have some real interesting projects. We have uh, the Smithsonian is in right now doing a project looking at vessel arrivals to tie bilge water to invasive species. So they're looking at when certain vessels came into the bay to see if they could tie that to, like, algae outbreaks. We also have um, some climate change scientists come and look at logbooks because logbooks always have weather listed. So they were able to go back and go through all these logbooks and get historical temperatures of oceans going back to the you know 1850s, 1840s. And they were able to put that into a climate map to kind of show which things are changing. So literally every day is different just depending on what people ask me. And um, 
that's what I love about it, and I love interacting with the community. I love when somebody has a personal connection to our to our works. I think John, if you want to talk about the Eva B, like the scrapbook we got, like how excited we were about. Sure, I like I, I think I mentioned with the Teak Lady there that you get an artifact, and a lot of people in this. That's beautiful about having such a a local focus in our collections is that. It's ties to the people that are local, and we get uh, all sorts of things that come out of the woodwork once we take a boat on or restore a boat. And um, we, we recently restored a, a power yacht, which I was going to show an image of, built by Pasconucci over in Sausalito in the 30s. And again, a family came for it, and this one was very unusual. We had the boat donated to us. It was under a different name, the Juanita. It's a double end. It almost looks like a Monterey, but with a beautiful cabin on it. And a gentleman was sailing by and saw it at the dock and said, that looks like the boat we had when I was a kid. And he came in all excited. It was a different name. And it turned out it was his boat as a kid. They lost track of it for 50 years. And they came in with photographs and artifacts and of the de launch day and the construction and the con Pasconucci and the grandfather. So that connection to the families um, and to the past is a real, that's rewarding for me. And all the, the new surprises, we'll get boats and we'll think, this looks old, it's got something. And then sure enough, years later, the story will fill in. And that's, that's, a, that's very rewarding. Now, I'm going to keep asking questions, and, and if I see a question for the audience, we're going to want to take one. And it's completely appropriate that in a day when we have librarians and archivists from San Francisco Bay yachting environment, that we would have an archive himself ask a question. Mr. Dewey Hines, sir. <laughs> yes, Dewey, you have a question, sir. Well, it's not so much a question. It's a little sidelight story, but uh, I've been in this club since 1954, and the boats like the Volante, and I worked for Myron Spaulding, and all this stuff was close to my memory. But one of the funniest things, that, stories that I thought was cute, a guy named Charlie O'Brien owned the Volante. And uh, I came down one day and said, Mr. Volante, can I go, I mean, Mr. O'Brien, uh, O'Brien, can I go sailing with you guys today? And he says, well, I don't know. And he knew my parents, and he says, you go home and get a note. So I ran up <laughs> three blocks got the note, came back, here you are, Mr. O'Brien, and he says, it's Dr. O'Brien. So he hit me right <laughs> on the top. And he says, you, okay, you can come, but you have to polish the brass first. No. Oh, okay, that's the price. So anyway, I, for several uh, you know, years, I, I sailed with them, and, and uh, one event I thought was fabulous. They were, they were all out, the good old boys out sailing, and they said, now you go sit up on the bow. And I go, well, why are you sending me up on the bow? So I sat there and didn't see many, one guy steering and everybody else is down below. So I snuck up and looked down the skylight and these old boys were looking at black and white nudie photos. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way it was in those days. <laughs> was, so the Volante has a special, and then yeah. I, went, I, went on, I went on to uh, come back in the summer in college and they'd say, see all those varnish baths? Varnish them. <laughs> well, see, that's the beautiful thing, is that, and especially here, there's a real, those kinds of stories are the stories we, we eat up and look to preserve, and uh, I know this gentleman has a few yachting stories, too, but that's, that's the, the great, rich reward. And here's Gino, just wants to make a quick question, we'll turn it to John. On, on that, when, uh, when I was asking about the stag party to Tinsley... Um, stag the, Cruise. Stag Cruise. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the cover of that uh, volume was too risque to share here today, uh, to go out to a national audience. Uh, so if anybody would like to see it, you have to make an appointment to see it. And I will need to see an ID to show that you are over 18. <laughs> so. Staff Commodore John McNeil. G Gina, I'll be right there. <laughs> <laughs> With a note from your mother, John? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no need. Gina's an old friend. We've, we've actually shared some information back and forth, uh, and visiting, the, visiting her archives, and they are yours, uh, is really a great experience. I'd recommend it to anybody. Do um, you show your etchings often, John? <laughs> <laughs> no, because they're, uh, uh, what do they call it, inkjet, and they bleed. <laughs> but, you know, do, do you do give programs in the evening at the museum sometimes, mm -hmm. yeah. as I'm, a, I'm familiar. Yes. And Dewey would make a great one. Oh, yeah, you know. I love But Dewey. how do people become aware of that? Because I'm pretty sure our members don't get a notice on those or anything, or, or how do you get to be part of that? And it may be as part of Charlie's business too, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, uh, we do do lectures. We do nighttime lectures and maritime uh, lunch lectures. And we have a great lecture series. Not as tech as this, I have to say. This is fantastic. Ours are more kind of like stumble up to the podium. Uh, but yeah, anybody here who's interested in giving a talk, I would be. Yeah, <laughs> I would love to have anybody here who's interested. And if you're interested in learning more about uh, the talks, we advertise on our Facebook page, on our Twitter page. You can send me your email address, and I'll add you to our events list. You can join the association. And if you join the association, you'll be on their mailing list, and you can find out. Um, they advertise all our events that we have, too. We just had a um, Moby Dick marathon at the uh, museum building where we read Moby Dick from start to finish in 24 hours. So you could spend the night in the museum reading Moby Dick. I was there for the whole time, and it's quite crazy afterwards. But yeah, so we do a lot of fun stuff. So yeah, please uh, sign up for our email list or join the association. And, and if you're interested in giving a talk, love to have you. So uh, we're going to have a question from the web. But before we do so, you mentioned the Pacific Inner Club Yacht Association in your talk. And we are familiar with that august organization, over 100-year-old organization. And this last Monday, I had the pleasure of going to the awards dinner. And uh, I've often been invited to this awards dinner. This time, there was quite a surprise at the awards dinner because they've done lots of research. And they decided that um, this year's recipient of the Yachtsman of the Year Award would, in fact, be a member of St. Francis Yacht Club. And he is our own Tom Eamon. So Tommy, smile. I saw the trophy. I was there when you got it. Um, and um, they, in their, um, that was probably a, a wise thing they did, but they also um, uh, named somebody historian of the year, yachting historian of the year, and uh, that would be a person. That would be a person who's done 700 of these talks at the Windsor Yachting Luncheon. So he, he's. A, <laughs> I was very honored, shocked, shocked and honored. Uh, that I would be uh, named a historian. So I'm, I'm sitting next to a real genuine archivist and historian. So I've got to ask you, what percent of your collection is yachting and what percent is commercial? Help us learn more about the, the collection. Uh, well, from the from the boat collection end of things, uh, I would guess that we have about 30% of the yachts. Uh, the, of the 110, we probably have about 30 or so, maybe 20, 25. Um, and then the rest we also collect in our park a lot of is of course a, a great museum of ships and a lot of boats came off the ships or were collected while the ships were collected by Carl Cordham in the old rambling great old days of ship collection. Um, so we do have vessels from around the world. We also have quite a nice collection of uh, fishing boats, fishing dories that fished aboard the Sea Aether, for example, uh, Monterey's, a couple of different types of Monterey's from around the Bay Area. So um, it's, it is, it is, there is more than yachts in our collection, uh, but yachts are sort of a, a, the newest rage and uh, very proudly uh, one that's gotten very nicely completed in the recent years. Associate producer Julia Whittakin, you have a question from the web. Uh, just a short one, and that is because the Yacht Club itself gets a memorabilia. Mm -hmm. And what kind of me memorabilia would you accept and welcome, and what kind do you not want? Oh, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, John and I are both actually on the acquisitions committee. So we have an acquisitions committee that meets oh. once a month uh, to discuss anything that's offered to us. And um, like I said, whenever we accept something, we accept it for good. So of course, we have limited time or limited space and funds to care for everything. So the discussions can get pretty pretty heated, or maybe not heat, pretty passionate, I should say. Everybody has their thing. Um, we like to focus on San Francisco. Our, we like to say we're Pacific specific, but not exclusive. It's kind of our collecting motto. Um, and it really is on a case by case basis. It's, it's the more, um, as we say in the archives world, provenance an, an item has, which means the more it could be traced back to this was begat by this person, begat by this. Uh, the more connection that it has to history, the more of a story it tells. We also look at things, uh, do we already have 100 of those in the collection? Does this fill a gap in our collection? Do you yeah, and I, I would just say that um, yachts and yachting, we've been with the boats themselves really campaigning for yachting 
uh, history and yachting culture. So we have quite a few holes as far as that goes, especially around the social activities, the, the milieu, the costumes, the, the, the social uh, world of the yacht clubs, especially the grand old ones such as this one. So um, we're, we're pretty open at this point towards, towards things that might be passing through these, these clubs. Wonderful. So we've heard from two archival members, as we call them. We have our third one with a question. Freddie Krause, what's your question? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I would like to know what you have left of the Wapama. And the reason I say that is my relatives used to take a, the ship like that up to Greenwood Bay up on the north coast. And then they would high wire over sure. to the land with all their fishing gear, their camping gear, and spend two or three months up there hunting and fishing and gambling and whatever they did <laughs> and then high wire back to the to the boat you know i mean they're crossing a wire like these yeah. kids do with these we have amazing pictures of that yeah and i would like to know what's left of it sure we have um the engine is currently on the pier right now uh, so you can see the engine and then when the vessel was dismantled we saved thousands of pieces, hundreds of pieces, uh, down to portholes, to slats, to um, all sorts of things. So all of that is available in our collection. We also have a beautiful model of the Wapama. We have uh, hundreds of pictures uh, documenting both her early career and then her uh, later, later life. Um, and then speaking of those Highline pictures, we have a beautiful collection of lumber schooner photographs. Uh, and we have great pictures of those high lines you're talking about. And it's amazing to me people <laughs> did that because it's terrifying. But, um, yeah, so we actually have quite a lot. Yeah, that was definitely a difficult uh, challenge for the park to, to let her go. And uh, painful for a lot of us who've been involved with her and caring about her and for her for a long time. Um, so, but I think uh, they did a good job of documenting. They did 3D scans and photographs. They've gotten beautiful plans and drawings. And really, that warehouse we mentioned in San Leandro, there's a big chunk of it with uh, big chunks or pieces and artifacts from the Wapama. So um, I think I, I feel fairly confident and good that we did what we could in the light of that uh, demise. Um, there's also great oral histories. That's something I discovered recently looking for, for boat action, small boat action, in fact. Um, credible uh, work by Carl Cordham in the early days and some of those other fellows, Harry Dring, interviewing the old... Uh, lumber schooner captains, and um, I got absolutely riveted at Gina's research center with the the, the hands-on first first accounts of the skippers from the 20s and 30s. Just incredible <coughs> industry and incredible men that 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 ran those ships. So uh, thank you for joining the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon live from St. Francis Yacht Club. Our guests today, Gina Barty and John Muir of the San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park. We love the good work that you're doing. Thank you so much. And with that, the luncheon is adjourned. <laughs>